All right, you can make your way over to Colossians chapter 1. That's where we will be starting this morning. And then we'll go into part of Colossians chapter 2. You know, when we read through the Gospels and we see people encounter Jesus in the Gospels and really tune their hearts to him, we see radical things happen in their lives. Teenagers dropped their nets and ended up becoming martyrs scattered to the ends of the earth as they committed themselves to wholeheartedly following Jesus. A Samaritan woman urged her whole village to come and see the man who told her what no one else knew about her as this outcasted woman filled with shame experienced the God who sees me through the person of Jesus who is the fullness of God in the flesh. Four men punched a hole in a roof to drop their paralyzed, despondent friend into the presence of Jesus because they believed Jesus was powerful and loving enough to do something. We see Zacchaeus give away half of his money to the poor. Let that sit in. He gave away half of his money to the poor when he met Jesus. Why? Something about Jesus convinced him that knowing and walking with Jesus would be more valuable than any possession he could ever have on this earth. A woman possessed by seven demons became the first to witness the resurrected Jesus. Jesus' love for her became more powerful than any temptation in her life. You know, as I'm continually exposed to these encounters by reading through the Gospels, I can't help but think how different what we see there is than what we see prevalent in American Christianity. It's so different, these encounters, than the idea of cheap grace that says, Just believe in Jesus and you'll be saved, followed by a resultant lifestyle that's pretty much the same as before and not much different than the culture around us. And while there's many reasons, yeah, we're coming in hot this morning. While there are many reasons for this, we're going to focus on one of them. And it's the one that's the overriding theme at the end of Colossians 1 into the beginning of Colossians 2. Let's read this together. Colossians 1, picking up in verse 24. This is right after the Holy Spirit through Paul has emphasized the supremacy of Jesus that Cordell talked about last week. Paul says this, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He, Jesus, is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Chapter 2. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. You know, Paul wrote this letter from a prison cell. 
That's why he says, I'm absent from you in body. And this is written to brothers and sisters in Christ in the city of Colossae. And so this is written, admittedly, the context is to those who've said Jesus is Lord, have committed themselves to living their lives of following Jesus. The title of the lesson this morning is Discipleship to Jesus. And this is one of those areas I spoke about that can lack in American Christianity. And before we get into studying out the specifics in this passage uh, about this, I want to give us a fairly simple definition of what we mean by discipleship to Jesus. We're talking about a journey of walking under the authority of Jesus involving intentional decisions and practices that lead to a closer relationship with Jesus, becoming more like Jesus, and living as Jesus lived. This morning, we're going to look at three aspects of discipleship to Jesus that we find in that section of Scripture we just read in the Holy Spirit's letter to the Colossians via Paul. And those three things are going to be commitment to discipleship, the practice of discipleship, and the fruit of discipleship. Let's start with the first one here, commitment to discipleship. And I'm going to go ahead and reread the first few verses of this section as we dive into this. He says, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I've become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the Word of God in its fullness, the mystery that's been kept hidden for ages and generation, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, when I compared those responses that we see in the Gospels with American Christianity, some of us may say, well, Of course, those people saw Jesus in the flesh. Of course they responded that way. If only I could see Jesus in the flesh, I would change more. I would grow more. But I want to present that that line of thinking isn't right. That line of thinking is perhaps a weak justification for continuing to willfully live a life of sin because frankly, We want to. We want the best of both worlds. Or we simply don't grasp the transformative power of God's grace and what it really means for the Spirit of Christ to live in us. That's the mystery that Paul speaks of here. Christ in you. You know, as those who've put their faith in Jesus, repented and been baptized, confessed Jesus as Lord of their lives, we have His Spirit dwelling in us. That's the promise we are given in Acts 2. That's actually more than those who saw Jesus in the Gospels had, not less. His Spirit in us. But there's a responsibility For us, that comes from that. Galatians 5.25 tells us that we are to keep in step with His Spirit who dwells in us. We have to commit ourselves to discipleship, those intentional decisions and practices that we've mentioned. And this is difficult. It's difficult in many ways to do this. Particularly, it's difficult because it involves suffering. Verse 24. It involves what he says there in verse 29, strenuous effort. In chapter 2, verse 5, we'll get back to that later. He speaks of the need to be disciplined. He commends them for them being disciplined in their faith. But let's explore verse 24 here a little bit. You know, Paul says here that he rejoices in the suffering and that his suffering is filling up what is lacking in regards to Christ's suffering. What? What? Like, is he insinuating that Christ's sacrifice on the cross is not sufficient? I mean, the sufficiency of Christ is one of the main themes of this letter. Well, in short, no, that is not what he's saying here. The context of this whole section is Paul speaking of his working to help others mature in Christ, to help others in their discipleship to Jesus. He's now speaking of the human relational component 
to discipleship. He's speaking of the role that Jesus has chosen to use his followers to get the gospel to the lost world and to help each other become more like Jesus. And Paul says it involves suffering. To do this, Paul says it involves strenuously contending with his energy, Christ in us, working. And Paul says in verse 25 that this work is what God commissioned him to do. The work he's speaking of in this context, this work of strenuously contending in becoming more like Christ himself and helping others become more like Christ involves suffering. So what's lacking in the suffering of Jesus on the cross is not that Christ's sufferings are deficient in their worth or merit as though they couldn't sufficiently cover the sins of all who believe. What's lacking is that that infinite value of Jesus' suffering on the cross is still not known to many throughout the world in his time, specifically to the Gentiles, and that's the commission he was given to take it to the Gentiles. Three ways that suffer, three way, there's more than three ways. Three ways I'm going to mention briefly that suffering is connected to our commitment to discipleship. First is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9. Jesus said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. This self denial is necessary for us in our natural selfish bent that we have. Self-denial is necessary in order to commit to the disciplines of life necessary to draw near to Jesus. These intentional decisions and practices that are necessary, we have to be intentional about them rather than just being led by what we feel or don't feel like doing in the moment. And we rejoice in this self-denial. Paul says, I rejoice in these sufferings. We rejoice because we get to be in the presence of Jesus by doing this. There is nothing greater than that in our lives here on this earth. A second area where suffering comes into play regarding discipleship to Jesus, we see in what the Holy Spirit, my goodness gracious, that just went through every slide in the presentation. Could you guys go back? There we go. All right. Goodness, did the button get stuck? Whoo! Demons. All right. We got to strenuously contend, man. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. It's no joke. Secondly, the Holy Spirit through Jesus' brother James says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Secondly, suffering is necessary in our own lives in order to become more like Jesus in our character. We represent Jesus as his ambassadors here on earth, and we represent him in how we navigate the sufferings of life. Do we navigate with a trust and a faith in our God or with doubt? Do we navigate by giving up or by persevering? Do we navigate with a joyful resolve or allow soul-corroding bitterness to take over our hearts? The command here is that we rejoice in this understanding we might not be joyful right in the moment, but overall, we rejoice in it, understanding the working of our Father in heaven and helping us become more like Jesus. Suffering produces perseverance, and that perseverance has to take place to help us become more like Jesus, not lacking anything. Thirdly, you know, self-denial and suffering are a part of helping others. So first we see it brings us into the presence of Jesus Secondly, we see it helps us grow to become more like him, but there's also the role that it plays in helping others, which honestly is more the immediate context Paul is sharing in Colossians chapter 1 there. 
The conviction that Paul is communicating in this section, this presenting, he said, my commission is to present God's word in all its fullness. This conviction that he's got to get the mystery of the gospel to those who don't have it. His conviction that I'm going to com commit strenuous effort to helping others become more like Jesus. All of that is in obedience to Jesus' command in Matthew 28. Jesus came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Go make disciples. Get the gospel to the lost world. And oh, by the way, after you baptize them, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Help the lost and help the saved. Discipleship to Jesus will not happen haphazardly. The Christian landscape is littered with those who said they believe in Jesus and yet have never committed themselves to obeying what Jesus commands. In other words, they haven't committed themselves to discipleship to Jesus. In some cases, it's due to an unwillingness. As I mentioned, just this desire to, I want to live how I want to live, but I want a Christian label slapped onto it. But in some cases, it's due to ignorance. All they've been told is just believe, just say this prayer, and that's enough. And in some cases, it's because those of us who know better haven't committed to laboring for their maturity in Christ after we baptize them. You know, we were realizing in this past year that, that we've not done as good a job as we can in this area. And that was part of why we committed the McCune's helped out with us putting together some follow-up studies. It's just a tool. It's a way of us trying to repent, take a step that we've got to be serious about Jesus' command here. And so many of you have been baptized recently. Hopefully you're going through some of these follow-up studies so that after getting baptized, we're still committed to teaching each other to obey everything that Jesus commanded us. The church is built on acts of self-denial as Jesus continues His work through us. But will we commit ourselves to discipleship to Jesus, making intentional decisions, implementing intentional practices that lead to a closer relationship with Jesus, that lead to becoming more like Jesus, and lead to us living as Jesus lived? If we say yes, Yes, I commit myself to that. Second thing we see. Okay, what's the practice of this discipleship look like? Let's look back at verse 28. Reread this. He, Jesus, is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, to this end of presenting everyone fully mature in Christ, I strenuously contend, not with my strength, with His strength, with all the energy of that mystery of Christ in you, so powerfully working in you. You know, I shared earlier this year uh, in a sermon that Barna Research reports uh, from recent studies that 56% of those in the United States who claim to be Christians say that their spiritual life is entirely private. 56% entirely private. However, even amongst those who state that spiritual growth is important to them, here's what they came up with. The percentage among those who say spiritual growth is very or somewhat important, 38% when asked what their preferred method of discipleship is, was on my own. That was the highest out of the four choices. On my own. I'm serious about growing spiritually, but I want it done on my own. We are fiercely independent and prideful people in the United States. We are. But the section of Scripture we just read communicates clearly that relationships with other followers of Jesus are a part, not the only way, but a part of how the Holy Spirit helps us become more like Jesus. You know, we also talked earlier this year about how 
the difference between a noun and a verb when we say the word disciple. We'll only ever be disciples, the noun version, disciples of Jesus. We're not disciples of each other. We're disciples of Jesus. But we have a responsibility to disciple the verb, the action. We have a responsibility to disciple each other to Jesus. And that's what this passage is talking about. So what is the emphasis of our discipling verb of each other in this passage? The emphasis is Jesus. Jesus is the one we proclaim, which makes sense. The whole section before this was about the supremacy of Jesus. It's not a commitment we make to a philosophy or to a theory. It's a devotion to a person, Jesus. And since we've committed to being disciples of Jesus, our discipling of each other should be emphasizing Jesus, His call for our lives, His teachings in our lives, His example. Even when Paul calls people to follow His example in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus. Because that's who we're disciples of. We also find in this passage the method of discipling each other. We do this by admonishing and teaching with all wisdom. We admonish and teach each other from the truth of God's Word. That means that our interactions with each other are not merely social, even though the social is a really beneficial part of the church. It's not just social. Our interactions involve the sharing of the wisdom of God with each other. Direction for becoming more like Jesus doesn't come from our own wisdom. It doesn't come from our own opinions. It doesn't come from the wisdom of the culture around us. It comes from what Paul called here in verse 25, the Word of God in all of its fullness. And what is the goal of this discipling, this action in each other's lives? It is maturity in Christ. He says we do this so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. The Holy Spirit says that He will bring to completion the work He has started. And one of the ways the Holy Spirit accomplished this is, this, is through these type of relationships with each other. Our goal in each other's lives is not to lord it over each other. It is not to control other people's lives. It's not to blame other people for our lack of growth. But the goal is to commit to helping each other develop convictions from Jesus' teachings that will result in a closer relationship with Him, will result in us becoming more like Him, and will result in us living like Jesus lived. It involves effort, though. Verse 29, again, for the second time, and we'll see in verse 1 of chapter 2 again, he speaks of strenuously contending. There's effort involved in this. But again, the mystery is Christ in us. So it's the Spirit of Christ working through us. So, I think we each should ask, are we involved in these type of human relationships with other followers of Jesus. If not, we are not practicing discipleship to Jesus in a key way that He designed for us to reach maturity in Him. You know, as presented in the New Testament, discipleship involves not just an individualistic relationship of a single pupil to his teacher, but rather the formation of a group around that teacher who is Jesus who called that group into existence. And that group is His church. And now, after calling His church into existence, He calls us to maturity. You know, one way to evaluate this is to ask ourselves, am I actively involved in spiritual relationships marked by vulnerability and accountability? Now, next week, we're going to talk about the fact that we actually need more than vulnerability and accountability. There's more to it than that. However, those are some traits that will go a long way toward us having 
these kind of relationships where we're vulnerable with where we need growth and we have some accountability from other people around us who we've all committed to discipleship in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Third, the fruit of discipleship. Do you mind going to the next slide, please, for whatever reason that didn't click, and I don't want to go through 30 slides again. So there we go. <laughs> the fruit of discipleship. I'm going to reread just verses 1 through 5 of, of chapter 2 here, following up what we just read there. Paul says, I want, after talking about this, this strenuously contending and uh, the method and all that, he says, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea, that was, that was a close by city, and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. I'm going to save the bulk of what's talked about in verses 4 and 5 for next week. It aligns with a thought that Paul starts to build on and continues later on in chapter 2. Uh, but I do want to talk about part of this here. You know, we already saw there in verse 28 that the overall goal of Paul working so hard with Christ working through him was their maturity in Christ. It's becoming more like Jesus. Now as he gets into chapter 2, he specifically mentions some other areas that discipleship to Jesus are meant to produce. An encouragement of heart. Being united in love. I love that section. Full riches of complete understanding of Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I read that I go, wow. Wow, that's fruit of discipleship we can have in our lives. You know, in this section, we see Paul communicating the heart he has for the brothers and sisters to do well spiritually. And it's a heart that is much like Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd. This is the good shepherd's heart. And Paul has this because he's committed himself to discipleship to Jesus. And therefore, the Spirit working through him is helping him become more and more like Jesus. So we see this shepherding heart come out in Paul. And we see it come out in action in his life, strenuously contending there in verse 29. In verse 1, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you, he says. You know, my prayer as we go through this is that this is how we will be for each other. That we will be people who strenuously contend for each other to do well. You know, the Holy Spirit wants us to be encouraged in heart by the truth of God's Word. How can we play a role in that? Well, we can commit to teaching each other to obey everything Jesus commanded. You know, the Holy Spirit wants us to be united in love. And we've seen from Paul's teaching an example here, that requires suffering on our part. There's a willingness for us to live lives of self-denial for each other's benefit and for His glory. You know, from an adult perspective at teen camp this week, one of my favorite aspects of teen camp was the encouragement that was being shown by the teens to each other. We had days where people, we asked them to fill out words of encouragement and we would read them to the whole camp, and it just built throughout the week. As well, there was a lot of competition. And if you've never been there, they want to win. Like, all right, this, I mean, they want to win. As we got to the last day for the high school, they got down to, there were, they had announced the order. They've, they've worked hard all week, and they got down, and they announced the third place team, so there's only two places left, and they're about to announce the winner. And I was standing right where I could see the, the green team was one of the two left, and the blue team was right behind them, one of them left. And all of them have their heads down. They're probably saying, like, little prayers or whatever. We want to read this. I'm watching. And then when they announced green team, of course, green team exploded, but without hesitation, blue team stood up and cheered for them. <laughs> 
There was no sulking. And that was the spirit throughout the week of this encouragement to each other across competitions and everything else. And man, that, that just really spoke to me. You know, the encouragement of heart that Paul prays that we can bring to each other, this unity in love. You know, a challenge for this week, for those coming to midweek this week, I challenge you, come to midweek with a specific encouragement for someone else in the fellowship. Practice Hebrews 10. Consider how you may spur someone else here on to love and good deeds this week. You know, the Holy Spirit wants us, we see here, to have the full riches of understanding of what we have in Christ Jesus. That we'd really be able to grasp that all the treasures that we could ever have that mean anything are found in Jesus. Satan promises us fulfillment in many things. And we get led astray to chase after them. But didn't just last week, in verse 16 of chapter 1, Cordell preach on what's stated about Jesus? We were created by Jesus and for Jesus. We will never be truly fulfilled except by walking with Him. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from Himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. You know, at the end of the section we read today, Paul speaks of being, he commends them for being disciplined and firm in their faith. And I think some of us were not disciplined and firm in our faith because we're chasing the wrong things. You know, we're only half-heartedly approaching this journey of discipleship and then wonder why we're not fulfilled. Our loves are disordered, and disordered loves lead to disordered lives. We were not born to be idolaters. We were born to be worshipers of Yahweh, the gracious and compassionate God, abounding in love and faithfulness, slow to anger, and yet does not leave the guilty unpunished. We were born to be worshipers of Him, We will never be satisfied with idols temporarily, but never the fulfillment we were created for apart from him. We were created by him and for him. In Jesus is all the treasures we will ever need. Do we really believe that? We're going to talk more about that next week. Please come back next week as we continue through this great letter that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write. You know, I pray that for each of us, we will commit to discipleship to Jesus with a willingness to suffer for the glory of Jesus, for the advancement of his gospel to those who don't know him. I pray that we will practice discipleship, proclaiming Jesus to each other, contending for each other so that each of us will grow closer to Jesus, become more like Jesus, and live like Jesus. You know, we talked earlier this year about the idea that disciples together strong. Give it to me. Disciples together strong. And I pray that we will contend for each other in prayer, praying that we can experience the fruit of discipleship together. But ultimately, my prayer as we continue this series is that the Holy Spirit will enable us to see how Jesus is more beautiful than anything we will ever experience and that Jesus is completely worthy of our whole, not half-hearted devotion.